As we were just talking about, President Trump, President Trump's trip to Asia winds down. Let's take a look at what the deals have been made and where the U.S. stands on trade. Joining us now in New York is Stefan Selig. He's Bridgemark Advisors Managing Partner and the former Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade under President Barack Obama. So, Stefan, thanks so much for joining us here on this Sunday evening. Great to be here, Betty. Okay, so you would give this trip what sort of a grade? Well, on the, on the positive side, uh, for the most part, um, the president avoided any major gaffes, uh, some a, a limited number of rookie mistakes in this important uh, first visit to Asia. He to kind of play it safe, didn't he? Um, on the other hand, there frankly wasn't very much accomplished, and I think that was what would have been expected, and it wouldn't have been expected because there was this fixation on the trade deficit, and the trade deficit could not fundamentally be addressed uh, on this trip. Um, and the things that they ended up accomplishing primarily were a limited number of commercial deals. So they bandied around $250 billion of deals with various companies. Mm -hmm. But in all fairness, I think um, that was much ado about nothing and, uh, and has been kind of received with the kind of yawn that I think uh, it really deserves. Right, it was sort of like as expected, right? Yeah, I mean, some of them weren't deals, right? Some of them were yeah. frankly just letters of intent and expressions of interest, and the other things were regular way, ordinary cor course business for these companies that they were going to do anyway. And so I think those were done as kind of the face-saving uh, way to show some progress. But yeah. on the real issues like intellectual property, like market access, like the ability for U.S. companies to uh, make fair investments uh, uh, in these markets, there was virtually no progress made. Uh, it was kind of ironic that that you know perhaps the biggest news had nothing to do with his trip, which was the fact that uh, you know U.S. banks or foreign banks are going to be able to invest further into securities firms in China. But we'll talk about that in a moment because that was a pretty that is a pretty big deal for Wall Street. Um, but in the meantime, you know there were others who came out with perhaps much harsher words than what what you just said. New York Senator Chuck Schumer tweeted out. Uh, this, uh, Stefan, Trump Asia trip a flop. POTUS acts like a lapdog to Xi and China, but talks tough to our friends in Southeast Asia. Pre presidency by misadventure. Well, look, what I would say is the president rightly is trying to build a relationship with his counterpart, President Xi. And in order for him to be effective and for all, order for all of his diplomats to be effective, they need to focus on building those relationships. But those relationships cannot just be at the highest level between presidents. They've got to be at the working level. And in fact, this is a new administration. Uh, a lot of seats remain unfilled in terms of the people that are actually going to be expected to negotiate these deals. And that's a real disadvantage. So I think those comments might be a little bit unfair, but they are necessarily insufficient to make the sort of progress that that um, we're going to have to make if U.S. companies are going to be able to compete on a level playing field in, uh, with China. Uh, Stefan, are bilateral deals, you know, even if they're, they're better deals, as President Trump might uh, characterize them as, with individual companies, are they sufficient to make up for the loss of retreating from something like TPP? Because you do have a president who seems much more comfortable, as you say, dealing at these higher levels one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, kind of curating these relationships with world leaders rather than being, you know, one of, of, of many, right? Do you think that not being part of T TPP or, or RCEP, as the case may Maybe is still going to be a huge economic loss for the United States? It's not only, Heidi, a huge economic loss. It's a huge loss in terms of our ability to have influence in the region. And TPP represented roughly 25% of global GDP. Ironically, while he was there, TPP minus the United States, so the 11 country TPP, uh, essentially reached agreement. This is roughly one sixth of the global economy. And our ability to exert influence in, the, in one of the most, in the fastest growing region in the world, um, is going to be significantly hampered by um, our, uh, our uh, withdrawal from TPP. Did you see that kind of characterize that shifting the, the retreat of the United States, the stepping up of China? You know, we know that President Xi had these global ambitions as he laid out in that three and a half hour long speech he delivered at Congress, right, saying that China will be in the coming years the global leader. Do you think that dynamic is playing out? And is, is that something that Washington is concerned about in terms of stepping back from things like multilateral trade, uh, climate change, that kind of thing? 
Well, I don't know if they are concerned about it, Heidi, but they certainly should be. So, um, as you know, China is in the process of putting together their own multilateral trade agreement called RCEP, and TPP is going ahead without us. So, um, you know, the, the wheels of commerce are going to continue, and to the extent that the United States does not have a leadership role in that, that is going to be to our disadvantage. You know, Stefan, just, uh, you know, what usually happens afterwards, right? Because we've been told throughout this whole trip that, you know, the real hard work happens after Trump comes back to the U.S. and, uh, you know, and all the officials underneath him start to really talk. So what happens after a trip like this? Well, in fact, a lot of the hard work normally should have happened before the leaders arrived, and the leaders then can actually, with big fanfare, take credit for some big accomplishment. We didn't see that, and so the question is now what is really going to happen? Is there going to be a fundamental renegotiation on our, in our bilateral trade agreement with Korea? Are we going to have um, a trade agreement with Japan, which we currently don't have, despite the fact it's the fifth biggest economy uh, in the world? And what are we going to do to fundamentally address these issues with China um, that the president has recognized, but I don't think has identified any path forward um, in terms of addressing them?